We have a nice small group tonight. <laughs> Let's start. Dear God, we're very happy to be here tonight with you. And we ask you please to make us feel your presence um, in what we read and in what we talk about, what we understand. Lord, everyone is uh, busy and tired and has many things to think about and worry about, as you know uh, very well. And we ask you please to help us set these things aside for about an hour so that we can read some uh, some of your word and uh, come away with it with something that refreshes us and makes us stronger for the week ahead. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So we continue our study of the Gospel of John. And tonight, I would think we'll probably cover verses 12 through 28. Of chapter 12. I have um, substantially reduced my review. Um, I say that every week, but tonight it's really true. I think I only have five or six slides of review this time. Um, as always, I remind us that the document that we're studying, the Gospel of John, is one of the four separate histories that were given in the Bible of the life of Jesus. And it's amazing that none of these contradict each other, while at the same time each of them has a unique voice and some slightly different content and perspective. And tonight, for example, we'll be reading the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it's something that all four of the Gospels remember, but each of them in a slightly different way. And so sometimes it's interesting to compare and contrast the way the different Gospel authors remember the same things from the life of Jesus. Uh, this is not the only book written by John, as I always remind us, there are others. Uh, we've studied the Revelation to John in, in this class. Um, and it's interesting to think about, I haven't thought about it enough maybe, that you know the, the events that uh, John saw in the vision given to him in, in uh, the Revelation to John, and the events that are now being recorded in the Gospel of John are very much overlapping. Um, it probably would be useful if you had time to go back and sort of go back through the Revelation and see how John's two different perspectives bear on, on the events surrounding the death of Christ. And this um, gospel, like all of the books in the New Testament, was written in a foreign language. It was written in, in the Greek language and translated into the languages that we read. And tonight, as, as we frequently do, there will be words that um, we, we wonder how to get out of Greek in exactly the, the right way. Um, that's just the nature of reading something that was written in another language originally. And we do think that John's Gospel was written mostly to Christian believers, although in later years, uh, non-believers you know, would have certainly read it and written mostly to, to Jewish Christians in the beginning, but later Gentile Christians more and more. In fact, tonight, one of the things that we will study in the text that we read in chapter 12 is we'll, we'll read that after the Jews had, had finally had their way with Jesus, finally some Greeks were starting to come to want to see him. And he saw that as the beginning of the end of his earthly ministry. Um, a point we'll return to in, in a little while. Um, this narrative history, this history of the life of Jesus flows this way, and I, as I said, I've compressed this a lot. On this first slide, we look at most of the first six chapters. The Gospel of John begins with an introduction where we're reminded that the one who came, became flesh and walked among us as Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was with God in the beginning. Um, we're reminded by John that Jesus' uh, adult ministry began at the time when he was introduced to the world by John the Baptist, we're reminded by John that Jesus performed many signs and miracles which attracted attention to himself. We're reminded of the time having attracted such attention that he retreated for a time to his home country of Galilee, passing through Samaria, where the Samaritans, even though it seems unlikely, and even though Jesus didn't seem to do many miracles there, Many of the Samaritans could recognize in Jesus the Savior of the world. And we read then after he returned to Galilee in chapter 6, 
of the signs and miracles he did there, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, and how Jesus warned the crowds that followed him that they were probably following him for the wrong reasons, that they were expecting something in this life, when in fact Jesus comes to give eternal life, a point which will be underscored in tonight's reading as well. This slide looks at three more chapters of John's Gospel. Um, these centered in Jerusalem. In chapter 5, though, at that point, Jesus was still living in Galilee. He, he had come down to Jerusalem for a festival where he healed a man on the Sabbath and began a pattern, as we see throughout the Gospel, of opposition by the Jewish leadership who are unhappy that Jesus heals on the Sabbath and unhappy that he speaks of God as his father. Finally, despite the danger, Jesus relocates to Jerusalem in chapters 7 and 8 from the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, where he teaches openly. And amazingly, despite the fact that he is very much opposed by the leadership of the Jews, um, Jesus remains free uh, to teach and to do miracles, which I think I've come to appreciate as one of the greatest miracles of all, one of the greatest signs of who Jesus was, that for three and a half years he could, he could do what he did, unhindered, despite the opposition that was brewing against him. Uh, in this, this slide uh, summarizes chapters 9 and 10, and in these chapters we have the story of the man born blind, uh, where I think John is helping us by using this, this one great sign which Jesus performed to see a, a, a distinction between the man born blind on the one hand, who's like everyone born blind but was given both physical and spiritual sight by Jesus, and the Pharisees on the other hand, who seemingly should have been able to accept Jesus a testimony concerning himself, but, but weren't. And I think that that distinction between those who believe and those who don't believe, between those who remain blind and those who receive sight from the Lord, is further eliminated by the lesson in chapter 10 where Jesus told sort of the parable of, of the sheepfold, where he says, you know, I have sheep who recognize my voice. Some of them are Jews, some of them are Gentiles. But there's, there's one flock and there's one shepherd, that's me. I'm the good shepherd who laid out my life for the sheep. And yet, there are people who, who don't recognize my voice. And he told the Pharisees that they didn't believe him when he told them that he was the Messiah because they're not his sheep. Right? So this is another theme in John and in the whole Bible, that the whole world basically at all times and places can be divided into these two groups, the people who hear Jesus' voice and follow it and, and the people who, who don't. God's sheep, and, and everyone else. In chapter 11, which I've now compressed to just a paragraph on this slide, we, we have the, the story of the, uh, the death and the rising from the dead by Jesus of Lazarus. And there's a lot to be said about that story, and we've said a lot in this class. Tonight I'll just notice that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, this was the seventh of his great signs prior to his entry into Jerusalem. And that we're told by John that many of the Jews who were there with Mary um, actually believed in Jesus when they saw what he had done, raising Lazarus from the dead. And that some of the people went and told the Pharisees what Jesus had done, and that really worried them because they reasoned incorrectly that if Jesus kept doing things like this, that finally the whole world would run off after Jesus, and, and then maybe bad things would happen. Surely the Pharisees would lose their importance. But maybe the Romans would come and, and, and take away the, you know, the, the, the political and religious freedom of, of, of Israel. Um, and then last week we started chapter 12, where we read the story about the anointing of Jesus by Mary. And you remember, despite the objections of Judas Iscariot, who told Mary, why are you using that expensive ointment? Um, she, she, with Jesus' permission and encouragement, anointed Jesus. Um, and because the raising of the Lazarus of the dead, John told us, many of the people now were attracted to Jesus. He's, he's back in Bethany where, where he performed that miracle. And just as the council feared, this is also has to do with the fact that Lazarus is walking around, who was, once, who was once dead and is now alive. And so now they're plotting even to kill Lazarus. The, the Jewish leaders want to kill Jesus, and they want to kill Lazarus. Uh, and that's where we are in the narrative of the life of Jesus as of the end of last week and the beginning of tonight's class. Right? So tonight we read on from verse 12 of chapter 12. And if I could ask some of you please to read verses 12 through 16 in Japanese. <laughs> 
白の枝を切っていく向かいに出ていったそして叫んだふさに主の皆によって来たる者に祝福あれイスラエルの方にイエスはロバの方に来てその上に塗られたそれは主の娘を送れるなり見よあなたのあなたの王がロバの方に乗っておいでになると書いてある通りである弟子たちは初めにはは初めにはこのことを悟らなかったがイエスが栄光を受けられた時にこのことがイエスについて書かれてありまたその通りに人々がイエスに対してしたのだということを思いましたありがとうございましたそれではいつもよりですはい今のウェイト The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of written about him and had been done to him. All right, so verse 12 um, says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So the next day would seem to be the day after last week's lesson where Mary anointed Jesus at Bethany. If, if so, that would mean that we're now five days before the Passover because in verse 1 of chapter 12 it said there were six days before the Passover and this is the next day. All of that's assuming that the dinner where Mary anointed、um, Jesus happened on the evening of, of the day it referred to in the beginning of chapter 12. It could actually have been a few days later, it's not that it's stopping it. in which case it would be even closer to the time of Passover as we read. In any case, I think this is all we need for, for this lesson is we're in the week before the Passover feast at the time when Jesus will be crucified. That's the feast that's being talked about here, the Passover. The third of three Passovers that John mentions in this gospel, the, the one that immediately precedes the death of Christ. So this explains why there's a large crowd of People in Jerusalem because they've gotten there. Remember, we were already told that the guys from out of town would come early to the Passover to purify themselves, so there's been a large crowd in Jerusalem for a while, and there's a large crowd there now, the week before Passover. And we were told back in chapter 11 at verse 56 that the people who had shown up early for the Passover were asking themselves, Do you think you'll come to the Passover? And we talked about why they would have wondered. Well, they were wondering because the word had gone out from the Pharisees that they wanted information leading to the arrest of Jesus. And so people were thinking maybe Jesus wouldn't come because it was too dangerous. They had been watching for him and wondering. But now they, they've heard that he's on his way. And I think here in verse 12, what it means is they hear that Jesus is now. Like proceeding into the city now. It's, it's not that he's coming soon or pretty soon or one of these days. He's actually on his way into the city now. That's what they've heard in verse 12. And the reason why I think he's coming presently, right now, is because of what it says in verse 13. It says, So, have, you know, having heard that he's on his way, they took branches of palm trees, John says, and they went out to meet him, that is, on Jesus. Crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Interestingly,、um, I, I said step aside and say, I don't know what churches you all grew up in, but in the church I grew up in, Palm Sunday was a big deal. Every year we would celebrate Palm Sunday, and it was a kind of a happy, victorious kind of a Sunday. You know, it was when Jesus. Triumphantly marched into Jerusalem. The Catholic Church is that way, and many Protestant churches also celebrate Palm Sunday. Baptist churches, maybe, maybe not so much. But Palm Sunday has been a big deal in the history of, of the Christian church. And only John, of all four Gospels, remembers the palm branches. So John, John's Gospel is responsible for Palm Sunday, the way I celebrated it when, when, I, was, when I was growing up. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you check, because all four gospel authors remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not John, all say that people laid their coats down in front of Jesus, donkeys, as the donkey rode into town. Matthew says, in addition to the coats, that they cut branches from the trees. It could have been palm trees, although people argue about how many palm trees they're, they're there were in Jerusalem, if everyone was cutting palm trees down, it might have been tough. Matthew doesn't say what kind of trees they were. And Mark says that they spread leafy branches that they took from the fields. So here's an example we have four Gospels, all remembering the, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and each of them remembering a slightly different aspect of what happened when, when Jesus came, with John being the one that remembers uh, the palm branches specifically. From what I can tell, palm branches did grow and still grow today. If Billy was here, he could tell us because he's been to Jerusalem a bunch of times. There's evidently, there are palm trees around Jerusalem, so people could have brought palm branches. And in other parts of Israel, there are a lot of palm trees. They could have had them too. People talk about the, the symbolic significance of palm branches, and they may not even be in it. It could just be that John is remembering Jesus entered Jerusalem as if a king, you know, people were throwing everything they could get their hands on in front of, you know, their coats, the leafy branches from the field, trees and palm trees. It, it may be there's some significance attached to palm trees. If you read in Leviticus, and also I noticed in Revelation chapter 7, it talks about palm branches being specifically laid down, you know, waved in, in case of Jesus. There may be some of that, and also politically, in, in Maccabees 1 and 2, which is part of the Apocrypha, not part of the Bible proper, but part of Jewish history, it's remembered that often palm branches were waved during times of liberation and repurification of the temple in Jerusalem and things like, like that. I read even in the first and second centuries that palm branches became a kind of symbol of Israel by the Roman government when they would mint coins. They actually minted a coin in celebration of the overthrow of Israel and they put palm branches on it because they thought that that was symbolic of the fact that they had overcome Israel with the kind of a, a pain to them. So there may be some nationalistic or, or religious aspect to the palm branches which John wants to bring into the story which is why he, he specifically focuses on the palm branches whereas the other gospel authors might have focused on, on other. So what all the gospel authors would, would agree on and did agree on is that what we have here is a kind of royal procession. Jesus is coming into the city the way a king would. And it says even here in verse 13, even the king of Israel, right? The people were screaming that out. Out of the census. They were saying that Jesus is coming in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel, right? Which is exactly what the council, the Sanhedrin, is worried about, right? They've been worried about that because they're afraid that if stuff like this happens, it's going to provoke a reaction on the part of the Roman government. Because the one thing the Roman government won't tolerate is extra kings popping up. You know, they're, they're not going to tolerate, tolerate that. And in fact, if the people raise up a king in the name of the Lord, here they've said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in the name of the God of Israel. If the Romans get riled up, they may come and not only take away their political freedom, they may try to get rid of God, right, to worship the, of the God of Israel. And so the freedom that the Pharisees and scribes and others have to, to worship in the temple and to worship Yahweh in their synagogues and so forth, the Romans could take it away. They had in other countries. The Jews had special privileges under Roman law, which might be taken away. And so that's what, what part of what the, the council said they were worried about, this whole business of kings popping up in the name of Yahweh is, is dangerous business in the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Here, in case you're, you haven't seen it in the margin of your Bible or something, um, I can just point out to you that this, this um, what the people are saying here, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is remembering Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. The part I've underlined here, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, comes out of Psalm 118, verse 26. And so, when that psalm was written, that song was written, it's imagining David or a descendant of David, a Davidic king, um, is being described there. And of course, Christians have come, uh, and rightly, I think, to read most of the Davidic psalms backwards in light of Christ, right? So now that we understand 
who Christ was when he came, we understand the, the, the eternal king of David who would sit on David's throne that the Psalms were looking forward to. And so that would make the Psalm about not just David and his descendants, but especially about one of David's descendants, namely Jesus Christ, who is now the, the last and, and greatest of the Davidic kings who will last forever, right? as God promised. So that is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, if you look in your Bible, is Psalm 118, verse 26. And the word here transliterated, Hosanna, from Hebrew or Aramaic or something, th this expression is remembered in Psalm 118, verse 25. And it means something like, save us, we pray, or give us victory now, O Lord, or something like that. By the time that it was said here, my sort of like palm branches have lost any very specific meaning and just been something that people were in the habit of proclaiming on such an, such an occasion. Um, but if it has a particular meaning, you, you'd want to look to Psalm 118, verse 25, where it has the meaning as you can see in verse 25 of Psalm 118. It says, save us or give us victory now. So in, again, in any case, people talk a lot about such details, but clearly to John, I think, he, he, and the other authors also, they want us to understand that this is a picture of the royal procession. Jesus is the king of Israel, he's the king of the Jews, he's coming into the holy city, the, the city of David, Jerusalem, and he is the Lord. And although people don't understand that clearly in his time now as readers of this time we understand. This is the ultimate royal procession. So Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords of all the kings there ever were ever at any point in time. But just a dim reflection of how Jesus is a king, right? And so this is the king of the universe, the Son of God, that you see here coming into the holy city now. Every other king is just a, a, a reflection of Jesus. Having said that, we see how Jesus comes in, and it tells us something about his character. Verse 14 says, And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Again, this is something, this business with the donkey is something that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all remember. John gives it just part of a sentence here. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. The other gospel authors um, give more details and speak of the, of, the, of the donkey at greater length. They said that some say one, others say two apostles went out to get the, the donkey from some place and, and bring it back. In some cases, we're told that there were two of them, a mother and, and a colt, and so on. I don't think John is being inconsistent with any of that. John is just only interested in the fact that as a result of all of that, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it and rode it into the city. And it probably also shows something I say every night by way of introduction. John is writing near the end of the first century having probably read Mark and maybe Matthew and parts of other documents that found their way into Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he's writing to a Christian community, a community of believers who already have heard this story a bunch of times. So his original readers know that Jesus rode a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And so John doesn't need to repeat all the detail that the other gospel authors did. He's pointing to this now for reasons internal to his own gospel story. He wants us to be reminded that Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Son of God, came into the holy city riding on a little donkey. And for John, and probably also for Matthew, the thing that both of these authors are trying to emphasize is that the way that Jesus came into Jerusalem on this occasion was in specific fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And Jesus almost surely knew this also. I, I dare say Jesus did it on purpose. I mean, Jesus sat on the donkey and came into Jerusalem because he understood that it was specific fulfillment of, of biblical prophecy. In particular, it's, it's the fulfillment of this prophecy. Verse 15 is, is quoted by John and also by Matthew. Actually, they're paraphrasing. This isn't exactly what you'll read if you, if you look it up. But they're par paraphrasing the prophet Zechariah saying, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. This is from the prophet Zechariah. And I just, rather than to save you the trouble, I've gone ahead and I've, I've reproduced it here for you. This is Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And when, <clears throat> when John or, or a New Testament author grabs a piece of the Old Testament, Usually they're not just grabbing the piece that they grab, right? He's quoted a fragment 
of Zechariah, but he's bringing Zechariah, all of it or most of it, with him, right? Um, and also, Zechariah, when, when he wrote verse 10, was quoting partly from Psalm 72, verse 8, which is a prayer of King David. So that's being pulled with it also. The whole piece of this, this scriptural anticipation of what's happening now is being remembered by God and being pulled up into his account. Right? So he wants us to remember Jesus was sitting on a little donkey because he wants us to remember that that's in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah and the prayer of David. Okay, and so here's, here's what Zechariah said in chapter 9, verses 9, in, in, in more fullness than what John excerpts. Right? Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And that last bit, which I put in bold on the slide, is, is directly quoted from Psalm 72, verse 8, which is a prayer of David. The psalm had been written considerably before the prophecy was, was given. So you see what, what's in John's mind and what John is trying to communicate by remembering, emphasizing in brief the fact that Jesus rode into town on a donkey, right? He's, he's trying to evoke the entire prophecy and the entire psalm which the prophecy remembers. And it all adds up to this, as far as I can tell, that Jesus is a humble king and a peaceful king. In fact, not at all the kind of king that the Pharisees were afraid of or that Rome might have resisted, right? Jesus is a whole different kind of king than what anybody was expecting. He was a humble king and a peaceful king, and he comes to rule the world, world in complete accordance with the will of God as has been foretold for centuries, right? In other words, this is what God was always doing. Now it's happening, and by the way, you Pharisees and teachers of the law, you should recognize this, right? He's, he's riding in on the wings of prophecy and prayers of David, and it shouldn't be surprising that he's a peaceful king and a humble king. And that's how he's going to rule. That's what John wants us and the believers he's writing to, to, to cotton on to. Right? But John is the first to admit that they didn't understand these things at that time. Right? In, in, in verse 16, John says, his disciples, and of course John is one of his disciples, his disciples did not understand these things. At but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. And I think John is remembering not just the stuff that John relates, but all the things that the Synoptic Gospels also related about the procession into Jerusalem and the things that had been done by and to Jesus. John isn't trying to review everything, right? He's trying to say that all that stuff that happened, some of which I've reminded you of, and other things you can read in the other Gospels, happened. And we didn't understand at the time what was going on, but later we did, right? And we've seen John say this before. If you look back in chapter 2, verse 22, let's, let's look there, John chapter 2, verse, verse 22. In John chapter 2, verse 22, is remembering the time after Jesus had, had cleansed the temple. And let me back up. Remember, Jesus had, had thrown the money changers and, and the animal sellers out of the temple. And then the Jews came to him and said, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Verse 18. Verse 19, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll right, raise it up. And the Jews then said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And John says, Here. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture of the word that Jesus had spoken. Right? So John is always conscious as he's writing this gospel that the things that are happening, although they're clear to John in retrospect, and they're clear to his readers in retrospect, were not at all clear to the people, even to the disciples at the time when, when the things happened at first. And I just want to say in passing, if, if you ever give a Bible to a non-believer, they'll probably read a lot of these things the same way the disciples did at that time. These are things that, you, that have to be read 
in light of the cross and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Or so they they don't make sense it. Know, and John is admitting that they, so even they the disciples didn't get it. They, yeah. They 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 Jesus is there. There. Okay. So John said that kind of stuff before. And here, and obviously Jesus did many things that nobody, not even his disciples, understood at that point. But later, as he said in chapter 2 and here again, later, in remembering these things, they, they understood. All right, so, and I'm just, you know, I was just thinking as I wrote up this slide today, in John's Gospel and all the other writings of the New Testament, all of them were written after the fact. All of them were written out of memory, right? These things happen and happen later after Jesus was crucified and after Jesus rose from the dead and after Jesus ascended and after the Holy Spirit came and went into the hearts of people. With all of that help, their memories went back to these things and started making sense of them, as, as we do still to this day by what we read in, in the Bible. And what's in the Bible is what the inspired memories and writing skills of these authors remembered for us, right? I mean, their, their memory is on them. <coughs> okay, so, uh, and it's not the passing, I already said this, but it's not the passing of time that gave them understanding. They didn't like time went by and suddenly they were able to figure it out. It's that something happened after that. Christ completed his work on the cross. And the Holy Spirit was poured out into the church, and then these things began to make sense. I'm sure that they needed time to reflect on it before they realized it. But <laughs> yeah. Time as well. I think, sure. But I think time un unaided would have produced yeah. nothing, probably, right? So Yeah, if you don't believe, then. And in fact, time, I think that's a good point. You know, time without the help of God drives every positive memory away, right? I mean, I, I think, I can think, I easily forget stuff God has done for me in my life. At the time, it seems so real, right? Absolutely real. And then a year goes by, and two years, and five years, and ten years, and look back, and you start to forget all the stuff that God did for you, right? And it's only with His help that you can even remember anything that, that God did good for you, you know, in, in the past. Okay, so that's point is worth making. All right. So now let's read on verses uh, uh, 17、18、19。また、イエスが皆たを墓から呼び出して、死人の中から蘇り出す。群衆がイエスを迎えに出たのは、イエスがこのような聖書を行われたことを聞いていたからである。そこでアリタイスたちは互いに言った。Okay, I'm going to read. Oh, it's okay. Steve can read. I'm just trying to give Steve a break because he's like always reading. But you can read, Steve. We don't okay. seem to have any little. Well, we keep forgetting to bring those out, it seems. Or are we completely out of it? No, we didn't see it. We didn't see it. Without you, honey. Oh, verses 17, 18, 19. Yeah, we I'll look for another class. Find some, yeah. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see, that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So verse 17 again says, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Right? So <coughs> we have this, remember, put in your mind this picture of Jesus. Triumphal entry into Jerusalem, yes, coats, palm branches, and other stuff you know, spread in front of him, and people crying, Hosanna, so blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel, this picture is very persuasive by itself. Even if you were deaf, probably, if you looked at what was happening now, Jesus would be making a big impact on you. But into all of that, and on top of all of that, is this constant testimony of this relatively large group of people who have been with Mary and see Jesus demonstrate that he has power over death. This is a very, very strong sign, right? And very close to the heart of what you need to believe 
about Jesus to be saved, right? Jesus has power over death. He has demonstrated it in the sight of Jews who have come to believe him. That plus all of the visual things that are happening now is a very impressive, very impressive sight. And, and you think to yourself, who could possibly stop Jesus from becoming king in, is in Israel now? If that's what he wanted to do, right? it seems like he would be unstoppable at, at, at this at this point, since he has that kind of power and this kind of attention and fame, plus all the testimony of scripture and the whole thing. We're even told in verse 18 the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign, right? So as I've pointed out before, in John's gospel more than in the others. Uh, well, actually, the raising of Lazarus is, is only told, spoken of in uh, John's Gospel. So in John's Gospel, it's the raising of Lazarus more than other signs, which John really focuses on as having been the, the one that really started turning people in Jesus' direction. I think for Mark and Matthew, it was the cleansing of the temple. But for John, it's, it's the raising of, of Lazarus. From John's perspective, from the perspective of John's Gospel, once Jesus raised the dead guy, and once Jews started believing in him, right, that's when people really started turning in, in Jesus' direction. Right? Jesus has power over death. I don't know if there's, there's, there are adequate, there's adequate words to even describe how, how powerful of a sign that is. Right? I mean, death is the one thing that finally kills everyone. <laughs> We all go down in death. It's the one thing nobody overcomes. It's the one thing everyone's probably underneath it all afraid of. You know, most people are afraid of, of, of dying. Death is the one thing about life that's constant and, and it's not it's not good if you you know until you come to, to know Christ in a way these people are only beginning to. But Jesus can call somebody back from there. You know, he's, he's called a guy four days dead out of the tomb and they've unwrapped him and he's alive and he's walking around and he's had dinner with him and he's still there and people are giving testimony we saw this guy bring someone back from the dead right? this sign is the one that's really, that's really making a difference here near the end of Jesus' ministry and the Pharisees in verse 19 say to one another you see that you're gaining nothing look the whole world has gone after you the whole, the, the world has gone after him here in ESV. The world has gone after him is, is a figure of speech, right? It's, it's like to the moment or something like that. It's not, of course, the whole world hasn't gone after him, him yet, right? That's not the point. The, the point is, a lot of people are going after him. You know, eventually, everyone's going to go after him. It's, it's that kind of a, of a figure of speech, but it's pointing in the direction of, of the ultimate truth, right? Helping us to understand you know, that having openly demonstrated power over death, if Jesus continues to live and continues to be Jesus, more and more and more and more people will go after him. There, there won't be any way that it will, that it will stop. Right? So from the Pharisees' perspective, this is a very bad state of affairs. And it can only get worse. And they say to themselves, you see, they're gaining nothing. Things aren't getting any better. They're getting worse from their perspective. Right? This, this is completely out of hand, they might say, in, in modern parlance. Right? So there's really only one thing that they can do. It's what Caiaphas has already said in, in what we read, it, read before. Is the, the really only way to change this pattern is to kill Jesus. Or at least put him someplace where nobody can ever see him again or hear from him again. Right? They have to make Jesus go away because otherwise everyone's just going to go after him. That's the problem that the, that the council has. Okay, let's continue. Okay.彼らは彼らの別祭だ、別祭だ出である、ピリポのところに行って、君をイエスに目に書かれたのですが、と言ってたのを、ピリポは判定のところに行ってそのことを話し、判定とピリポは、ピリポはイエス、イエスのもとに
しかしもし死んだなら、いかかに利用もするようになる。自分の命を愛する者はそれを失い、この世で自分の命を憎む者はそれを保って永遠の命に生きてるのもし私に使えようとする人があれば、その人は私に従ってくるのように、そうすれば私のおるところに私に使えるものもまたおるであるもし私に使えようとする人があれば、その人は父を重んじてくださるである。There's actually considerable discussion among Bible commentators about how we should understand who's being described here by the words of the three. Let me make a few points in that connection.、Um, in the New Testament, almost always, the word Greek winds up being used as a synonym for Gentile. These may have been God fearing Gentiles. You hear them spoken of quite a bit in the New Testament.、Uh, Gentiles who nevertheless were attracted to the God of Israel, who attended、uh, synagogues, who read the Bible, the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian the Cornelius, and a lot of famous characters in the Bible were Gentiles who were attracted to, to, the, to the God of, of Israel, who were loyal to the God of Israel. And the reason why some people think these Greeks might have been all or mostly God fearing Greeks is if you understand the grammar here to mean that they were actually themselves. Went up to, is, to Jerusalem for the purpose of worshiping at the feast of the Passover. If that's the case, <clears throat> then they must have been God fearing Gentiles, otherwise they wouldn't have gone up to, to celebrate the, the Passover. It's not entirely clear that, that you have to read the sentence that way. You could, you could say that they, they were among those who were motivated to go there at this time. In order to worship, and if they were, they would have been God fearing Gentiles, most likely. Some people will push it and say they may have even been proselytes, meaning non Jews who had converted to Judaism and who are now Jews by, by conversion. That's also a, a possibility. And there are even some who would say that they might have just been Jews who happened to live outside of Palestine, which I'm going to resist a little bit because it seems to be not what John is up to. Here. <clears throat> I think that the thought that John is working with here is that these are some of the other sheep not of this fold to which Jesus refers in chapter 10, verse 16. Remember, Jesus has been talking to Jews, to Jews, to Jews, to Jews. His, his gospel comes first to the Jews. And he says in the, in the parable of the sheepfold to the Pharisees, by the way, I have other sheep not of this fold, and finally there's going to be one fold and one shepherd, and almost everybody understands that to me. One day there's going to be a universal church, 
Believers in Jesus Christ, some will be Jewish, some will be Gentile, but nobody will care because it will all be one, one, one flock and one, one shepherd. And I think here what we have is is evidence that of some of these other sheep, the non-Jewish sheep, showing up to try to talk to, to Jesus. That's the Verse 21 says, So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And I think the non-Jewishness of these guys is emphasized here by the fact that when they sought to approach Jesus, they approached the only two of his disciples who had Greek names. And these guys also lived in Bethsaida, which is on the northeastern tip of the Sea of Galilee, sort of on the edge of uh, the Jewish lands, and on, on the edge of what, what, what do they used to call the Decapolis or whatever. It was on the edge of, of, of Greek territories, or you know, non-Jewish territories. And so it seems to me that the picture we're getting here is that some Gentiles, Okay. from far away, not, not part of this flock, but far, part of the other flock Jesus has in his mind, has started now showing up too. And when they do, they don't get straight to Jesus, but they go to those people who surround Jesus who are the most guiding friendly as, as it were, and the, the easiest for, for, for um, Gentiles to talk to. Verse 22 says, Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So, it's interesting, the Greeks didn't approach Jesus directly, they approached through these two guys. And I'm not the first person to notice they're the only disciples who had, who had uh, Greek names who, who, who probably were from lands that were sort of familiar with, with Gentiles. Um, but Philip and Andrew didn't take them to see Jesus, which is kind of interesting. You know, previously when you've seen somebody ask about Jesus, Philip or Andrew would have said, come and see, you know, we'll take you to the Lord. But they don't, they, they don't do that, or at least John doesn't remember them having, having done that. And I think that we're probably being reminded here that evangelization of Gentiles was not part of Jesus' ministry. It's very, very rare in, in all four Gospels where Jesus finds himself talking to Gentiles, and it's always an exception. Right? It's, it's always being used as an illustration of the failure of Israel. Right? Jesus will say, if, if such a faith were in Israel, right, as this centurion, or why should I give the scraps to the dogs? Right? I mean, it's, the, the Gospels really emphasize the fact that when Jesus came to this earth, he came to the Jews. His, his, his ministry, as his living ministry, was, was to the Jews, not to the Gentiles really much at all. And so it may not be so surprising that, that you see this here. Verse 23 says, And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Right? So having been told that some Greek Gentile type people, now even, want to see Jesus, triggers a response on behalf of Jesus, his telling his disciples, it's time for me to die now. Right? This marks the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. His ministry has gone, has done about as much as it can do or will do among the Jews. The Greeks are starting to show up now, and it's the time for Jesus to go to the cross. It's nearly time for him, as he said, to lay down my life. He, he knows the time is coming very soon, and one of the marks of the time of his laying down of his life is that the Gentiles are starting to show up. So verse 24, so Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So as I've been suggesting, I think Jesus understood that his ministry to the church universal, that is the, the church of believers in Christ of all time, right? consisted of both Gentiles and Jews, and he understood that that ministry could only go forward after his resurrection. The Great Commission, if you think about it near the end of, of Matthew, where Jesus sends everybody out to make disciples in all the world, could never have happened by Jesus himself. Right? He was a human being. He couldn't be in more than one place at one time. The only way that the gospel of Jesus Christ could go forward into the wide world was if it went by many people, all of them filled with the Spirit of Christ, which is what the church, what the church does. So that's what, not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to bring the basis of our salvation and to give the Spirit to the people who would go out and share the gospel. And I think Jesus 
course, knows that and many other things besides. If, if he doesn't die, he remains alone. If he dies, like a, like a grain of wheat, he'll bear much fruit. He won't be alone anymore. There's a whole bunch of them. It's called Christians going out everywhere with the gospel. And then many people will be saved, including the Gentiles. And it's necessary for Jesus to die. In several places, Jesus says, it's better for me, for you, if I, if I go to the Father, right? because until he goes, the Spirit can't be given. Right? So it was necessary for Jesus to die so that the world could be saved. He knows that, and the time has come for that. And what evidence that the time has come for that is the Gentiles are starting to sniff around now. <coughs> Verse 24, he, uh, still, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, and whenever Jesus says this, it means that he's getting ready to dispense a really central truth. And I think that the way I read verse 24 is that the necessity of Jesus dying is one of the greatest, most central, most important truths in, in the universe. Jesus just had to die in order that he could raise from the dead return to the Father, bring in our salvation and point out His Spirit so that the Gospel could be shared in the world and other people could be saved as well. And if you think about it for a long time, at least this is the way it occurs to me, without the death and resurrection of Jesus, mankind couldn't exist. God couldn't have created men. He couldn't have let Adam fall. There wouldn't be any resurrection. Everything that ever has existed of which we're aware as human being depends on the fact Jesus has to die. Because Jesus is the way that God and man will be reconciled and, and saved eternally. That's, that's the stone on which everything else is built, and that's it often enough in the Bible too. I use the cornerstone. Unless Jesus dies, nothing else works. And Jesus knows that, and talk about pressure, right? <laughs> Jesus, everything depends on him. Everything that's ever happened or ever will happen depends on Jesus dying. And that thought must be in Jesus' mind as he says what John remembers then in verse 25 because he's clearly thinking about dying now, right? He says, whoever, loses his, whoever loves his life loses it and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Right, so Jesus had to die so that, so that he could be resurrected and save it. Mankind. But men, normal men, like and women like you and me, we can't enter into eternal life without passing, first of all, through death and resurrection, just like Jesus did. Right? He's the first of many brothers, but he's the first. Everyone else has to follow him. There's no other way to get to God except by passing through death and resurrection through Jesus. So that means we believers in Christ, we have to be ready to sacrifice this life and the life to come. Just like Jesus was ready and willing to sacrifice this life for the life to come, not only for himself, but for, for, for everyone. And that's what he says in verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will, will honor him. Right, so this is just another way of saying that we have to be willing to lose our life if we want to keep our life eternally. We have to follow Jesus and serve him in our life, and in death, and then on into eternal life. All these thoughts seem to be present in, in the mind of the Lord here. And then just two more verses I want to cover tonight before we finish, so that we end on the right note. I added these two verses before I came because verse 26 is not the right place to end. But in verse 28 would be better, I think. So let's read these two pieces. <laughs> しかし私は私はこのために黒く切り立ったんです。父よ、皆が眺められますように。ずっと天から声が立った。私は日々栄光を表し、そして単に栄光を表してやる。Steve, you want to finish off? Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? 
but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So verse 27 says, remember Jesus has just been talking about the necessity of death, including his own death. Um, and you might suppose, if we had a different kind of God and a different kind of Savior, that that's not a big deal to Jesus, right? I mean, you, you can imagine a, a story where, where he's so godlike, and he's, he's so filled with the sense of his own mission, and with the happy outcome that there will be for himself and for other people, that he enters into his human death happily or something, right? You could, you could imagine that kind of a story. It's almost surprising that that's not the kind of story that we get. What we get instead, and not just in John's Gospel, but in the Synoptic Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels we get the same point in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prays, Father, if this cup can be taken away, but not my will, but thy will be done. That same idea is being dealt with by John here in, in, in a different connection, but Jesus is saying the same thing in, in both places, and probably he said it in many other places. Jesus is troubled by this. It says in verse 27, now, in view of my coming death, it's just a few days away, and it's necessary, and everything depends on it. Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. And remember before now, his deep groaning, his deep grumbling, the weeping that we puzzled over a little while ago when he was raising Lazarus from the dead. There's something going on inside Jesus, something human, that's reacting to all of these things going on in a way that, that, that could only happen if he's really a human being. I think this is so important, but I'm not sure I can explain why I think so. But I think when we have trouble, like if, if you're sick, if you're in the hospital, if you're near death, if you're really up against it, somehow it's easier that you know that Jesus was there also, right? If, if he was just some kind of God pretending to be a man who never really knew what you were going through, right? It wouldn't be quite so easy to handle, but because of how Jesus is, he, he, can, he can be our Savior and Comforter in, in times when, when we have trouble, right? So here we see Jesus is having trouble. Verse 27, he says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Okay, so knowing that we have to be willing to suffer and lay down our life in order to honor God and inherit eternal life like we were saying in the previous verses, doesn't mean that's easy for anybody, not even for Jesus. Right? Maybe especially not for Jesus. People often speculate that what Jesus went through was much worse than anything we're asked to go through. And that, that may well be since he's atoning for the sin of the world. But here we have the picture of Jesus. Yes, Jesus could suffer. Yes, Jesus could be un unhappy about having to die and to suffer. Yes, Jesus could consider whether he should pray to God to cause it to take it away. And in spite of all of that, we see that Jesus realizing that he's supposed to die now, and that that's what he has to do in order to honor God. Okay? So that's, that's it make us feel better also, because you know, we can say that we should be willing to, to lay down our life, to have eternal life, we should hate our life so that we can keep our life, but in fact, nobody likes to suffer, and nobody wants to die, not even Jesus. Suffering is suffering, by definition. Suffering wouldn't be suffering if it wasn't suffering. Right? I mean, it's, it's bad. If Jesus, if Jesus were to suffer, he had to really suffer. And death is something that there's no, no dog, no cat, no bird, no human being, no fish, no organism that has life almost can easily accept dying, right? We'll all fight to our, to our last breath to stay alive, basically, right? It's a natural behavior on the part of living beings, and Jesus is a, is a human being just like we are, right? So suffering is not easy to accept for him, and death is not easy. <coughs> Furthermore, we're told by God and by Jesus that we're supposed to pray for the relief of our suffering and the preservation of our life. The Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, for example. Right? I mean, the whole Bible teaches us that it's okay, and in fact, we're supposed to pray for all things to the Lord, right? 
If you have a problem, if you're afraid you're going to die, if you're sick, if you need healing, if you're hungry and you need food, if you're poor and you need money, if you need clothing, if you need shelter, the Bible doesn't say that you're not supposed to pray to God for help, right? We are supposed to pray to God for help for all of these things, right? So what Jesus is teaching here is not that we should just take whatever comes to us and never ask God for, for help. He's not saying that. So we're supposed to pray for preservation of our life and the lives of those we love and to ease our suffering and the suffering of those we love. Except when it comes time to endure it, right? So that's what we're seeing now in the life of Jesus. He's a normal human being. He's been living like we lived, eating when he was hungry, sleeping when he was tired, putting on clothes when he needed to put on clothes, praying to God for his daily bread, teaching other people to pray that way, depending on God for everything he needed in the life. And he said all kinds of comforting things to people about how God will take care of you in this life, right? Jesus, that same Jesus now that has come to the point where he knows he's at the end of the road here. He's now come to the crisis. He's come to the point that he came to earth. Now. now it's time for him to die. This is his time. So then he says, well, what should I do? Should I pray that God would take this away too? And he realizes, no. The answer is no, because I know that this is what I, what I came to do. He knows that he has to do it. And so we can see how Jesus handles this, not like some superhuman being that doesn't understand how hard it is to accept suffering and death, but like a human being who understands how hard it is to accept suffering and death in obedience to God. And I think we all come to that point too, right? You know, at least at the time of death, but, but maybe other times before that in our life. There are points in our life where we, we, we come to understand that God is expecting us to suffer. And then we have to endure, we have to endure that suffering. So here we see how Jesus handles it. Jesus says in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I'm pretty sure this is God. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Right? So, when there's a choice between our life and our comfort and God's glory, then following the example of Christ here, we're supposed to prefer God's glory. Nobody's supposed to love misery for its, for its own sake. Nobody's supposed to love death because they despise the life God has given them. But if it comes down to a trade-off between God's glory and our comfort, God's glory in our life, then Jesus is showing us what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to prefer God's glory to our own life, to our own comfort. And I think that that's the mark. You know, Jesus in chapter 10 is talking about his sheep and, and, and my sheep know my name. The mark of Jesus' sheep is that they're going to follow him even into suffering, even through death, and on into eternal life. Jesus got out ahead of us and he showed us. There comes a time when you may have to suffer and you may have to die for God's glory. He did. Here's how he handled it. We may too. We have to follow him in, in that also. So, anyway, in short, we don't have to be miserable all the time. We don't have to not appreciate or enjoy our life. But there may come crisis points in our life like Jesus faced and many other people have faced where for God's glory, the thing that we have to do is to endure suffering and then we have faith that Christ and the Holy Spirit give us the strength we need to endure the suffering through those times also. And then we just follow Jesus' example in this and in All right, now we're near the end of the class, but I have one discussion question that struck me as good to present to you in the last five minutes or so. In verse 28, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And, I, and at least I think we understand that this is Jesus has faced the question, should I endure this death and suffering that I know has been prepared for me, or should I ask God to take it away, because I don't want to suffer and die. And he settles on obedience and God's glory, which is what we have to do for Christians and follow him. So he says to God, okay God, do, do what, what you want. Right? Glorify, glorify your name. And then John recollects that a voice from heaven said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And I'm just wondering because I don't know the answer to this question. I wanted to ask you guys, what, what do you think? 
To which acts of glorification is God referring? He said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. What does God mean there? Anybody have a guess? Not a guess. Though. Greg, it's not so much a guess. I mean, don't misunderstand me. I'm not... A deep spiritual insight? I mean, there's not a deep spiritual <laughs> insight. It's called reading ahead. And the next few verses, the Lord does explain okay. a lot. How does he explain? Well, after... After we read, just after verse 28, verse 29 reads that John remembers, the crowd stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. They like heard hearing like thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. But Jesus answered, The voice has come for your sake, not mine. Okay. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So, God is referring to, well, if I'm reading it correctly, I know I, I make mistakes, but if I'm reading it correctly, it does seem that he is referring to his death and resurrection. Okay, so if, when God says, I'll glorify myself again, he means in the resurrection of Christ? I think so. And this is for, this is for, for the, for the people's reassurance, for those that were around Christ when they have heard this voice. According to Christ, this is for your benefit, not mine. That God's words are true, that God's words are trustworthy, and you can believe in it. Which is very comforting in a time of great struggle. And in verse 33, John explains, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, God is going to glorify himself in the resurrection. God has glorified himself in the past. What's the reference there? I have glorified myself and I will glorify myself again. What, what's the first instance this thing? Well, well it might not be obvious to everyone and it might not be obvious to all of us either because there's a lot that's being said that I have glorified it would be I mean with, with the English past tense what he has done in the past what we know of that he has done from the scriptures being the Old Testament scriptures and the life of Christ there has been a lot that has been done and there is a lot to be done and I will glorify it. Mm. And again, the reference of the good Lord will suffer death. He will be raised from the dead. And we are assured of being resurrected with him. Yeah, certainly the second one is the resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the miracles, but I don't know. But this again was what, what Greg said earlier in the, in the lesson. It's so true. We have a great the scriptures help so much in seeing what had happened so that we can understand it. If I was with this group and I heard, have glorified it, will glorify it, huh? Yeah. I would have that same question. What is this? Uh, Could it be just Jesus came to the earth? And I think it's part of it, dear. Definitely part Maybe. of it. Maybe. May I say one thing? Yeah. Uh, it says that the, what is that the glorify of God? Uh, glorify God is that the, uh, God show God's power. From the beginning, Jesus did something for the miracles. 
somewhere that the verb here translate glorified is translated in the Lord's prayers, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. <coughs> right? Maybe we're all saying the same thing. I mean, God, it's almost like Jesus is saying, should I, should I do what I humanly want for myself or should I, should I obey God and glorify God? And Jesus says, Father, glorify. What does he say? Father, glorify your name, right? Thy will be done. <laughs> and it's almost like God is saying, I always do. Yeah, right? I've been doing that all along, and ain't nobody going to stop me. <laughs> so. That's a very good answer. I mean, it, I mean, part of the reason why Jesus has to die is to fulfill the just requirement of the law. Right? He's glorified himself in, 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 in that way also. And he'll glorify himself. Like we studied Revelations in this class. He'll glorify himself when Christ comes again and the whole thing is consummated, right? So from the beginning of history until the end of history, God is glorifying his name. And I think God's people, especially Jesus, are, are participating in, in God's glory. But even we can participate a little bit if we follow Jesus. And, and so, so God will surely be glorified. Jesus will surely be glorified. But even, even we will be glorified if we, if we stay with them, right? If we, if we follow them. あの、yeah, yeah that's, those are really good. Mm -hmm. Very good points. Greg, forgive me on this. I am reminded of a song that we sang. Are you going to sing it? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank God for it. <laughs> 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 the, the part of those words, you know, uh, in my life, Lord, be glorified. In my song, Lord, be glorified. In your church, Lord, be glorified. And it's really useful to read the hymnal sometimes because it read it references that the writer of the music was reading Philippians chapter 1 verse 20 and so I looked this up and I'm gonna take just kind of a few words out but won't change the meaning the Apostle Paul writes it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Just what we've been saying. Yeah. Okay, let's pray.
dear God, we understand a little bit that uh, you're so holy and so glorious that you'll always be glorified no matter what, that nothing can oppose you, uh, certainly not us. Um, Lord, we thank you um, that you have sent your son Jesus to do the things that needed to be done to reconcile us with you, to pay the price for our sins so that we can have a relationship with you and so that you can cause your spirit to live in us and that you give us then the opportunity and even the ability through the help of your spirit to obey you even in times when we need to suffer and, and even in times when we may need to die as in the end we all will do. Lord, we ask please, similar to what uh, Steve was reading in the, the passage from the Apostle Paul in Philippians, that everything we do would honor you, whether in life or in death, and that uh, you would please um, uh, fill us with your spirit and lead us always in, in the right direction, protecting us from evil and, and leading us away from temptation so that we will glorify you despite the very great weaknesses that we find in ourselves and the sinfulness that still persists in us, Lord. Please forgive us and please help us. And <clears throat> I do hope that, you know, in some way, the time that we spend here on Tuesday night will, will be um, something that contributes to our, our understanding and our, our ability to serve you better. Please help everybody to get home tonight uh, safely and please bless each one here and please help us all. to love one another and be attentive to those around us who may need uh, your, your help through us. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.